Hello and welcome to Merthyr's Hidden Past, a weekly podcast brought to you by Cavartha Castle Museum and Art Gallery. My name is Christopher Parry and I work at Cavartha Castle Museum and Art Gallery and this podcast is all dedicated to the history of a town and a place in South Wales that has a massive impact on Welsh history for many, many different reasons. Many people know Merthyr Tydfil to be in the home of the iron industry, the dominating force in the iron industry in all of Britain at a time, containing not one but two of the world's largest ironworks. But anyone can find out that type of history by just typing Merthyr Tydfil's name into Google and going on the Wikipedia page and things like that. But this podcast is all about the hidden stories. Last week we started our first podcast, which was part one of this one. So if you didn't listen to last week, then I would highly recommend you do. But yeah, last week we started part one of The Man Who Killed Sherlock Holmes, which was a very unknown and hidden story all about a local boy, Evan Powell, who turned into the personal medium for one of the world's most famous authors. And now we're going to continue his story and take you into the next stage of his life when he became known as the man who killed Sherlock Holmes. Evan Power, as we discovered last week, was a miner from Merthyr, born in 1881, and he discovered he had mediumistic abilities by the age of 16 in 1897. Now, at the end of last week's episode... We talked about a sit-in that he had with Mr. Southey and other people within Merthyr and this put his name on the map. But what would then further reinforce his reputation as one of the as one of Britain's best mediums was his relationship with Arthur Conan Doyle. Now Arthur Conan Doyle first came to Merthyr in February of 1919. He was touring the country promoting spiritualism. He had recently released a book called The New Revelation, which was all about how he had finally, at the end of 30 years of investigation, decided that spiritualism is real and communing with the dead is possible and should be used as a tool to better humanity. And he was trying to now go out around the world and to spread the news of say, of spiritualism and the strength of it. And so various historical, uh, sorry, not historical societies, various spiritualist societies engaged with Arthur Conan Doyle to bring them to their part of the world so he could speak to them. And Merthyr was exactly the same. So Merthyr brought Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in the Theatre Royal in February 1919. If we jump forward slightly, how did Evan Powell become known as the man who killed Arthur Conan Doyle's favourite? favourite character. In 1955 he did a talk, a lecture. By this point he was in his 70s and he was still doing sit-ins and everything for various people and he had been invited by Panath Summer School to speak about his life and times. So he attended Panath Summer School and spoke to the audience there about his experiences. All of these were then condensed down into an abridged version which appeared on August 27th, 1955 in a publication called The Psychic News. Now the headline of this article read The Man Who Killed Sherlock Holmes. But you get a little indication of why people refer to him as that when you listen and read the words that he spoke because he kind of infers himself that he was the reason that Arthur Conan Doyle gave up write in this famous character and chose to write instead about spiritualism and other things along that line. For example, in in the talk, Evan says that on July 16th, 1915, now remember that date for one sec, he persuaded Conan Doyle to come to Merthyr to speak. That date has been remembered wrongly and it's a rather weirdly specific date to remember so, so wrongly as well. Evan said he induced him to come to Merthyr and persuade him to come to Merthyr. And when he came, they had a seance in the house, house of Mr. Southey. And on the balcony outside the house, Evan went outside after the seance to speak to Arthur Conan Doyle. And he said to Evan, Evan, tonight I'm going to commit murder. And while the editor of our newspaper and many other people always infer from this, 
is that he is saying that he's murdering the creation of his characters like Sherlock Holmes and others and he's not going to write to any of that anymore he's just going to write about spiritualism which indeed he did primarily for the last years of his life wrote almost exclusively about spiritualism but obviously the date and other little parts of this are a little bit inaccurate now we will forgive Evan that because he is in his 70s this is a long time after the fact but thankfully we have Arthur Conan Doyle's writings and accounts of all of his major encounters with Evan Powell. The first time the pair actually met was after the first time he came to Merthyr Tydfil in 1919. So he came to Merthyr in February, then went away touring around the country giving other similar speeches and one place he was given that speech again, death in the year after, was in Portsmouth in September 1919, on September the 7th, 1919. Now, he was engaged to talk to a group of 1,600 people about death in the year after, but coincidentally, another person had been booked in to speak at that same event, and that was Evan Powell. Evan offered to give Lady Conan Doyle and Arthur Conan Doyle a sit-in. And so, an impromptu seance was arranged. They did it in, in the hotel rooms, so Arthur Conan Doyle now cut six strips of rope and tied Evan to, the, Evan to the chair in six different places. So the arms, the legs, the torso and other places, they were all tied and bound tightly to the chair. In Arthur's own words, they were bound so tightly, in fact, that they had to cut it with a knife to get him out later on. And the seance began in total darkness with Evan Power doing his usual thing of going into a trance, heavy breathing and slowly but surely being embodied and controlled by Black Hawk, who we talked about last week and we will talk about much more in depth as we progress now. One of the first things that started to happen in the seance was physical manifestations. So. Evan being fully bound and tied to the chair, obviously, there were flowers on the mantelpiece. And flowers would be such a recurring thing in all of Evan's seances. But either way, there were flowers on the mantelpiece within the hotel room they were doing this seance. And they apparently came round and went around the, uh, the faces and the noses of those present. And they could feel the wet stems and other things for, and the blossoms from the flowers on their faces. Not only that then, there was also a megaphone in the room. And this was a normal occurrence in Evan's seances as well. Normally they would be singing voices through it and other things like that. But either way, this megaphone was painted with a luminous paint as well. And that's done previous to the se seance starting to show it moving in the dark, if, if at all. And indeed, the luminous megaphone did move around the room and according to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle you could see it physically moving around the circle above and other places. When they turned the lights on the room had been moving around totally and a large flower stand apparently in the corner of the room moved this way into the centre of the seance circle. Evan Powell was now a main focus of interest for Arthur Conan Doyle because he had never experienced such an abundance of physical occurrences happening in a seance that he was present. So he literally insisted that they do a second sitting, which they did the night after. All of the exact same things occurred this night after. All of the same movements, all of the same flowers, the luminous megaphone floating around the room. But this time voices, various voices started coming from the other side to talk to those present. Evan's voice was changing in character and it was even changing at the same time apparently. There was a famous film director in the room with Arthur Conan Doyle at the time and his wife Jean and while Jean and Arthur Conan Doyle were having one conversation through Evan with the other side this film director was having a totally different conversation. Both of them claimed that they were aware of that conversation happening in the same room and they could pick out little pieces, but it was like Evan had two voices coming through him simultaneously. 
But the voice that's really important to Arthur Conan Doyle that came through, came through and it said simply one word coming out and instantly Jean and Arthur Conan Doyle recognised the voice and knew exactly who was speaking to them from the other side. The voice simply started saying the word Father. Jean and Arthur Conan Doyle recognised the voice as their, pa as their son Kingsley who had lost his life during World War I. They started interacting immediately and started saying, Kingsley, are you okay? And he was talking to them and saying, yes, he's okay. And one, one, of, the, one of the monumental things that happened is that Arthur Conan Doyle felt a hand on his head and a kiss on his head and he swore that he was his son. Even Evan Powell's voice was in the manner of his son's voice. And they asked him if he was happy and Kingsley replied that he is so happy. And that was a gigantic, monumental thing. It was the first time that Arthur Conan Doyle had experienced communication with the dead that left him under no questions. He was totally and utterly convinced that that was a reality and no one could change that fact. No one could refute it at all. Not long after was when Evan Powell actually convinced Arthur Conan Doyle to come to Merthyr. Arthur Conan Doyle came to Merthyr twice in the same year and the only reason he did that is the first time he came to give this speech that he was touring the country and the second time he came, which was in December of 1919, was because Evan invited him to come back and speak and he said to Evan, I'll come back if you give me another sit-in. And he did come back on December the 2nd, 1919. He wasn't in the Theatre Royal this time, he was on the Drill Hall, which is still there. It's a building at the end of Brecon Road in Merthyr Tidville. You can now get MOTs there fairly cheaply, I think. When he came, he did a speech again, a similar speech to the first time, and then he met Evan Powell and Mr. Harry Southey, and they all convened to start a seance. Now I'll skip forward slightly to you because what is interesting about this seance is that Arthur Conan Doyle actually says outright that this seance give him final inspiration, a final big push. Now he'd experienced lots of pushes towards spiritualism in his 30 years or so of investigation in his own words. But that seance with Evan Power and then this further seance that took place in Merthyr Tidville was seen as another source of inspiration. So much so that in 1921 he published a book that was called The Wanderings of a Spiritualist. Now what this book was all about is Arthur Conan Doyle wandering around the world, talking to people, finding out about things and spreading the world of spiritualism and spreading the good work of spiritualism and how people should literally take it seriously and not listen to the old ways of doing things and try something new and look at spiritualism in a very serious way. Chapter one of that book when it came out in 1921, is titled The Merthyr Seance. And I'll read to you the extract of the opening of that book. It was one memorable night when I walked forth with my head throbbing and my whole frame quivering from the villa of Mr. Southey at Merthyr. Behind me, the brazen glare of Dowless ironworks lit up the sky and in front twinkled many lights of the Welsh town. For two hours my wife and I had sat within, listening to the whisperings of the voices of the dead, voices so full of earnest life and desperate endeavours to pierce the barrier of our dull senses. They had quivered and wavered around us, giving us pet names, sweet sacred things, the intimate talk of the olden time. Graceful lights, signs of spirit power had hovered over us in the dark. It was a different and wonderful world. Now, with those voices still haunting our memories, we had slipped out into the material world, a world of glaring ironworks, of twinkling cottage windows. As I looked down on, on it all, I grasped my wife's hand in the darkness and I cried aloud, My God, if only they knew, if only they could know. 
perhaps in that cry rung from my very soul lay the inception of my voyage to the other side of the world. The wish to serve was strong upon us both. God had given us wonderful signs and they were surely not for us alone. This second sitting with Evan was a major, major turning point in his life. So not only had he now, had he now through Evan established contact with his son, he had also through Evan finally achieved this conviction beyond all belief that it's his purpose now to spread the word of spiritualism. That seance took place by all accounts pretty much on December the 2nd, the same day as the talk he did in the drill hall in Merthyr in 1919. During that seance, Arthur communicated with his brother who had passed away, but also he mentions the lights. Now you might think that's kind of dramatic or licensing or poet or you know melodramatic licensing really, but either way, one of the predominant parts of Evans seances going forward from this period was that he was able to apparently conjure lights orbs of lights within the seance and they would travel around the circle and around the room and interact with people and go quite close to their face and even in some cases light the room up so much so that Evan could still be seen in the room bound to the chair but we'll get back to that more in a second now because what happened is Evan Powell and Arthur Conan Doyle became very close. So much so that just before he departed in 1920 for that voyage around the world to spread the good word of spiritualism, the last person he met with before he went was Evan Powell. He gave him a last seance and he had the joy of the last few words with his arisen son, as he put it, who blessed his mission and then assured him that he would bring solace to all the bruised hearts around the world. While Arthur Conan Doyle was moving his way around the world, Evan Powell actually left Merthyr Tidville as well. And he started to live and would live the rest of his life in Devon. A book appeared in 1924 that was, all, that was called My Psychic Adventures. That was by an American author called Mike, uh, Malcolm Bird. Now Malcolm Bird was writing for a publication called The American Scientist. Or Science America, it's one or the other. Gone out of my head now. In that publication, in 1924, it detailed what would happen in an Evan Powell seance. They decided to do it under strict experiment conditions to hold a seance and to see what Bird would discover and to see if he could see any fraud or anything like that. What would happen is that Evan Powell would first be searched. So he would strip off most of his clothes and Bird would search him. And this would be, for Evan, this is a fairly regular occurrence. This is how he would normally outline a lot of his seances he would normally do this as a routine thing most of the things i'm about to say would normally be quite routine for any seance that evan was part of because he was insistent on being on not being called a fraud essentially evan was called a cabinet medium which means that he had a classic kind of say on a medium cabinet within the room which he would sit next to not inside but next to and it's just literally if you imagine it as just a curtained off rectangle sometimes it can be circle but it's like a little cabinet and inside they put different objects and apparently it's easier for the medium to create manifestations and whatnot and psychic energy within the cabinet the cabinet was set up and evan powell was sitting next to it there was a local clergyman sitting on his left and then bird sitting on his right other members, other 10 other people in total were in the room, including relatives of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and whatnot. And they started the seance. They tied and bound Evan to, the, to a chair as normal. This time they used one long strip of rope and they tied it in all manner of different knots around his body. And on every knot they put a wax seal, which obviously if it was broke, they would be able to tell because a wax seal would be broken. They would also tie his thumbs together with string, which would make it obviously very difficult if he did get out to then get out and move things around without any thumbs. So the seance started, he got embodied by Blackhawk and Bird was one of the first people 
to be quite unimpressed with the start, really, because Blackhawk would start communicating with Bird, and then a voice of a person came through Evan and started talking to Bird. But the problem was that Bird didn't have a clue who this voice was. He didn't have a clue who the person was or anything. And so this spirit went away a bit miffed that he wasn't remembered by Bird. So either way, Bird then recounts in his accounts, in his book, that um, nothing really, nothing, nothing major happened in way of communication. But the whole seance was amazing in its physicality, in what was physically happening in the room. What, what happened was the cabinet had within it a table with a vase on it full of flowers, some bells, a trumpet, which was very similar in size and shape uh, to the megaphone, so it's not a trumpet with keys, it's more or less a megaphone to be honest, but he describes it as a trumpet in his book. Uh, they're all inside the cabinet and obviously the circle is all there and the clergyman is sitting in front of the cabinet as well. One of the other things to make sure that Evan doesn't move is he asks Mr Bird and the clergyman to both stand on his feet. So then after the communications f failed, the physical movements in the room started happening. First the bells were flying around the room and touching people's faces and ringing and then the flowers started going around the room. At first Bird felt some wetness on his cheeks and it made him jump but then he realised when a person next to him felt the blossoms and smelled the flowers that it was the flowers going around the room and each individual flower was kind of going past the noses and touching people. The table started moving out of the cabinet and hovering around the circle and around the room before he would finally lay down in the centre of the room. And by the end of all this, there was one thing that happened that really convinced this bird and he saw this appearance of lights again, appearance of orbs. The way he described them, it's like orbs that were dra draped in thin cotton. They had a kind of dull light to them that were all going round the room and one came up and sat and settled inches away from his face apparently. Evan would go on and on and live the rest of his life doing this. He would die in 1958 and he would be a well-renowned and world known in certain circles medium and no one has ever proved or disproved any of his abilities or any of his claims it literally is all down to your own personal beliefs i would it would be irresponsible of me if i didn't mention one thing that i stumbled across now black hawk was this native american who embodied evan powell and he was the first person that took him over now for those who were would listen to the first episode you will know that we talked about Evan first being controlled by Blackhawk which was in 1897 and the first words he uttered in that seance was ma ka tai mi shi kia kiak which translated into Blackhawk from some unknown to me Native American language now the room full of people in Merthyr when this first happened and Evan himself were all mystified by the character that had come out to you and they all asked who is Blackhawk? Evan himself even pondered when this first happened is he a figment of my imagination or is he real? In one sitting later on Blackhawk said through Evan that there was a book about him and he said that if a book or a copy of the book rather could be obtained that it would prove his existence and coincidentally one of the sitters in that seance was just about to go on a trip to America and they, they said I'll find it, I'll search for it and I'll bring it back if I find it. So six or so months later this person returned with the book and contacted Evan and said oh look I found this in a random bookshop and it's true, everything you've been saying about Black Oak or everything Black Oak has been saying through you or is all true. And so this gives further proof to the genuineness of Black Oak and, the, and Evan's sit-ins. Now the problem with this is, is that there is a perfectly plausible way in which Evan Powell could have known all about Black Oak. The Evening Express, which was a Cardiff published newspaper which was widely distributed in Mercedville, 
had an issue that published a strange and unique story on the front page. It was titled Black Hawk the Warrior. It was a short and abridged version, but still incredibly detailed version of the life of Black Hawk. And even within the first lines, you can read the words Ma Ka Tai Mi Shi Kia Kiak. The biggest problem this article throws up, though, is the date that it was published. It was published in January the 7th, 1897. The exact year that Evan was first, or became first, controlled by Black Hawk, which is an astounding coincidence. This doesn't prove or disprove anything, though. And indeed, all of Evan's story can be seen in whatever way you choose. One thing is pretty certain, is that Evan's story is totally unique, and Merthyr has never produced a medium on the scale, and certainly not one that has been a personal medium to one of the world's most well-known authors. That brings us to the end of this week's podcast. So I hope you've enjoyed listening this week and I hope you've enjoyed the story of Evan Powell. It would be massively appreciated if you could share this podcast as much as possible and let us know that you've enjoyed it. Give us some comments and feedback. That'll be massively appreciated indeed. Next week, we'll bring another hidden story from Merthyr's past. And that's all about a sculptor who came from London in 1928 to settle in Dowlas, which is a part of Merthyr Tidville. And there, he went on to change the lives of hundreds of unemployed working men women and boys and girls but thank you very much for listening and stay safe and i will speak to you all soon